Hi, this is Sapin Bharti with Rob Hirschfeld. This is our limited series on scaling infrastructure as code. And in this episode, we're going to talk about distributed environments in context of infrastructure as code. Well, distributed is not a new buzzword. It is becoming buzzy recently, uh, just like Web3 and Edge. How would you define distributed in today's world? So, oh boy, it, it certainly is attracting a lot more attention with Edge and Web3. And this idea that we can't just put everything in one location in the cloud. Uh, but to us, it really means something much more than this. Um, distributed means that you have infrastructure running in a lot of places. It might also mean that you have a lot of teams working in different places. And, and both are, are valid versions of how we look at distributed when we talk about infrastructure as code and infrastructure as code operations. It, it is really important though, when you think about this, is that assuming that we have an edge site or a multi data center site, or even a multi-cloud infrastructure. Um, and when I say multi-cloud, I even mean regions of the same cloud provider where you're working across a, a, you know different sites, even the same provider. In those cases, a distributed environment means that the control planes that run the infrastructure in those environments are local to those environments. And this is, to me, a really important thing to realize. We have a lot of, of technology systems today that centralize control into a single server or a single site. It's, it's easier to do that because you just have one place to manage of one source of truth. But the infrastructure itself is generally distributed and multi-site and multi-region and multi-zone and multi-team. And the, the thing that we see when we talk about distributed ops is recognizing that we have our environments in different locations with different control planes and actually building our infrastructure as code models to match that reality on the ground. Um, and it, that's a really important aspect because if you lose control of one site, you can't have that site go offline. You need the sites to be localized. Um, and funny, even with teams, if you don't want one team to interfere with another, just like you don't want one site to interfere with another. So there's a lot of ways in which thinking about things as a distributed infrastructure, distributed environment, really translate into a much uh, more resilient infrastructure as code plan and process. ISC is more about reuse and sharing. How does that work in hybrid and multi-cloud and edge, and of course, this uh, distributed uh, environments? This has been an unexpected benefit to us with how we've looked at infrastructure as code using immutable version controlled re repeatable modules. So when, when we look at that, you know, disciplined approach to building automation and sharing automation, it really makes it much easier to do work in distributed infrastructures and distributed teams. Because now you can come back and say, for this site, I know exactly what's installed in that site, what versions are installed, how it's built, what the components are. Um, and you can do that in a way that says, oh, here's, here's the artifacts that I need to run the site and describe them completely and build them completely, right? Uh, for us, our customers even run in air-gapped environments, meaning they have no outside connections. They can't be connected in, they can't connect out. And so they have to be able to be completely self-contained and defined. We can do that because the infrastructure as code systems have you know, version controls, management, and immutable artifacts that all can get bundled together. Um, and what we found is that those two pieces work incredibly well together. Um, and it's been a really nice synergy of having that, that portability uh, and distributed infrastructure. It, they really have built on each other. Have you seen that companies are struggling or they struggle with keeping different sites in sync? Yeah, this is one of the biggest challenges that we see um, when we talk about distributed anything. Uh, it's the synchronization problem for, for how sites work. And so, what, what we've seen as a challenge here is that it's easy to confuse the configuration and the automation with the state of the system. And so when, when we're helping companies build multiple sites or even multiple teams, what we like to do is we like to make sure that the, the state of that system, the control plane, is localized as much as possible, that the source of truth for those systems resides as close to the systems as possible. Um, but if you want to have a remote or shared control story, so let me try and be specific. If I have a centralized team that wants to manage hundreds or thousands of edge sites, they want to be able to watch what's happening in those edge sites. But if the internet's cut, the, the edge sites shouldn't go offline. You don't want a store to fail because it's lost touch with corporate. 
Um, and so what happens is you want the state and the control plane to be as localized to that distributed system as possible. But you actually want the centralized system to be able to update, change, push management updates, take right, have a lot of authority about what's distributed to that site. And so what we found is, is that by having that tight version control, you can have the centralized system push out the automation on a planned schedule and then still subscribe to updates about what's happening in the control, um, in, in the control plane locally. Uh, that for us has been an incredibly powerful system to be able to mix and match the configuration and automation pieces in an immutable way and then let the site, the, the state on the sites actually be run locally with mirrors back to the centralized system. It's, it's a really healthy balance. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to get right. And you know what we've seen you know, prior to rack end, we've seen a lot of customers, especially as they grow in bigger sites and the software that they're using is very dynamic and changing. They'll end up with drift, um, and once the site controls and automation start to drift, then it becomes almost impossible to uh, patch, update, and maintain the, the infrastructure. Um, the, some of the war stories on this are, are heartbreaking because you know thousands and thousands of hours go into you know just figuring out what you have installed on sites, let alone patching and upgrading. And since you're talking about automation, I'm also curious: uh, is there an opportunity or scope for uh, pipeline automation with dev, test, production, AB rollout? Pipeline automation is, is absolutely critical. And this CICD application to infrastructure as code is, is absolutely essential to really scaling infrastructure as code. What, what we see happening here is that if you can do a development process and have people you know, write their infrastructure as code, lock it up, and then hand it over to a test group that can verify exactly what's happening against the, the systems and the platforms, right? try and recreate production as carefully as possible. The opportunity to test and verify that automation works correctly becomes really high. Um, it's nice that you, you know, we have a lot of automation to build sites and tear them down. So the test itself can be highly automated, which, which helps improve performance and makes it more likely that people will test. But then once you've, you've validated that, the fact that you can pick up a site and a description of a site exactly and then roll that out into production, and then basically do an A-B test where you move individual sites slowly and change them over time. Um, that allows the operations team to have a lot more control, right? They've verified that everything works. If things are going well, they can replicate and accelerate the success, but they don't have to push a button and watch all their sites change at once. Um, they, they can pull control back and do this in a very methodical way um, because there's, there's really, Nothing more uh, challenging than a production team that rolls out a patch across the board and then realizes that there's something wrong with that patch and is scrambling both to remediate the problems the patch caused and then redistribute the patch. Um, and so you know, being able to control that process in a very fine-grained way is essential to growing and scaling the systems. Uh, and it's worth noting, this is true even for multi-team collaboration, right? It's easy to imagine that you have a, a one team that's fixing uh, software that everybody uses. You want to be able to say, take, you know, test this version and then have the teams slowly adopt a change or implement a change. You don't want to force them to take a change. Um, that's actually just as unproductive as not changing. Uh, since you just mentioned, you know, of course, uh we can share a code between site and also you mentioned about the collaboration so also talk about if there is a self-service angle when it comes to sharing code between teams as well this has been one of the most remarkable things to me about racken's journey through distributed and multi-site management because we built a lot of capabilities for multi-site management strictly to support you know globally distributed uh infrastructure but our customers are using that feature as a multi-team collaboration feature. Um, and this is, it's been really fascinating to see. When, when we're talking about different teams, they have very similar needs to different sites. They want to have autonomy in their operations. They want to be able to make changes and fix things and, and change without having to get you know, permission through a centralized authority. And they also want to be able to take changes that they uh, make and improve and send them back up into the rest of the stream so other people can use them. So that, that very much every team gets to do development and fixing and changing on what they're doing and send that back up. And that's part of this collaboration process. The other thing that I think is really important to note, and I, I was just touching on this about 
um, how pushing a, un, an unwelcome change is, is just as bad as getting behind. Part of what we've seen happen in this distributed system is that individual teams can choose when they're ready to upgrade the software. So right, Rackend doesn't deliver it as a SaaS. We don't force upgrades on anybody. And even within our, our customer base, they have multiple teams and those teams can choose when they wanna bring in the new versions of the software. And so that degree of control means that they're actually able to coordinate operations. They can watch what's gonna change. They can prepare for a change when they're ready for it. So just like we would A-B test across multiple sites, you have teams that can A-B test and decide when they wanna bring on a change to their infrastructure. Um, now, the nice thing is, is that because of the way we've modularized the automation, it's pretty easy to bring in those new changes, but they don't have to. They get to control their destiny. And, and fundamentally, controlling your own destiny is the essence of distributed operations. That's what makes it makes it all work. And it does seem after listening to you that it, as we started talking about distributed operations, it's like it has many layers, many di dimensions. It could become intimidating also when they look at it. So if you can quickly you know, summarize, you know, what it really means uh, to, to companies. Yeah, the, I think that when people look at distributed operations, the first thing that they should be thinking about is, is how do I coordinate actions across all of my systems? And, and one of the things that, that we see is important here um, is that this needs to be thought about earlier in the process rather than later, especially for edge deployments, right? This idea of how I'm going to migrate, move, update, patch, right? Um, those are really critical distinctions that people need to have in, in this. Um, and the dimensions become not just configuration, but also the automation that drives the system. And, and I think this is the, the, the key take, you know, one of the key points here is that it's not just, are my sites different? All sites are different, all teams are different, all clouds are different, that's normal. The automation that gets driven by them is going to change also. And so you have to accomplish, uh, recognize that it's not just that the sites are different and have different configurations, but there's a time element in how all these systems work together. And so you might have a new configuration that needs to propagate that requires new automation code to be supported or new artifacts to be supported by that. And you can't just change one thing, new configuration. You actually have to have a way to coordinate the operations for configuration, automation, artifacts, infrastructure component, teams, right? It's, it's actually a, a culmination of, of all of those factors coming together that makes distributed ops distinct and, and why it's its own, its own specialized thing. That said, if you can get it right, it's incredibly powerful. We see huge ROIs from our, our customers having consistent distributed operations efforts. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> And when you look at all of it, uh, what kind of impact it has on uh, day two operations? It's a really important point with this. Um, you know, it's easy to think only about the, you know, bringing sites up or getting sites running and get, you know, getting everything going. What we have found is that the most impactful approach is to start from the day two needs and think about how we're doing things on day two. Because a lot of times the day two work includes things that you would be doing on day one or day zero, you know, patching a system, uh, re-imaging a system, getting it back up to speed, rebuilding, bringing new infrastructure on site. Those are day two operations, but they involve good day two, day one and day zero disciplines. And so what we see is that the better you can do building a system that brings in new changes and responds to changes or for distributed ops, is actually able to send out information, you know, raise alerts, monitor things, tell you when, when something's changed or there's a security challenge, right? Having those systems wired together and building that up, sort of working from day two back to day one is really a, a much more powerful way to pick and choose uh, your distributed ops um, where, where you're gonna build that environment and what tools and platforms you're gonna use to make it happen.